what a privilege it is to be a child of God. And I'm so thankful that God not only loves us, but cares about us. What a great weekend we had. And what a great, um, I just, I love church. I love our Sunday morning, Sunday nights. I love our Sunday school. I love our Wednesday night Bible studies. You know, this world is a big lie. We'll be in Isaiah 66 in a minute if you'd like to follow along. But we live in this world that it'll lie to you. You know, when you're young, uh, kids, they get these lies. If you're pretty enough, you'll get the right guy. And if you're handsome enough, you'll get the right girl. And if you get that really, really cute girl, boy, then you'll be happy. And uh, you think, if I get a girl as cute as that, she'll just think I'm awesome. And you don't realize she thinks she's awesome. She just wants you around. So you will think she's awesome and selfishness. And, and um, people think if they, they get lied to, if you get enough money, then you'll be happy. If you get enough position and popularity or power, you'll be happy. And man, what a lying world. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, a bunch of folks gather together around an old book. And we talk about a coming kingdom and a coming king. And we talk about the, the promises of God, that God's going to take care of us and look after us. And that this world's not my home. I'm just passing through. And we find peace and happiness, whether whether we're poor, living in a little rented apartment, or whether we got a big, beautiful home and a good business or whatever, the, the, this book is a book of integrity. And I was thinking the day about, about people who, it's just sad. It's sad. They get so messed up in their thinking. And I think, how do you get so messed up? Um, how do you get thinking that you can be ugly and vicious and vile and, and uh, hurt people and and, uh, and, you know, and think you're going to succeed. How could you be a Hitler and think you're going to succeed? How could you? And, of course, that's way down the road. But there's a bunch of little Hitlers. There's, there's you know, schoolyard bullies who think they're little Hitlers. And, and uh, there's, there's, there's husbands or wives thinking that they're going to run their home and run their spouse and run their business and demand their way. And my way or the highway. And how, how in the world do they think that's going to make them happy? You know, Jesus said, if you lose your life, you'll find it. But if you love your life, you'll lose it. And that's a pretty simple statement. He said, selfishness is going to give you absolutely nothing but death. And living for others will give you life. And um, greed, uh, he said, labor not to be rich. You should not put your time and energies into riches. That is, that's a simple statement. Labor not to be rich, cease from your own wisdom, Proverbs says. And um, you, people who, who every day, every waking hour, it's all about what money they can make. And Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 6 in that area, he said, uh, you can't serve God and man, and you'll love one and hate the other. You'll cleave to one and despise the other. Money, you can't serve God. And if, if you want to make God money or God, you are kicking God out of your life. And, but I'm in Psalm 66 here, or Psalm, in Isaiah 66, I'm sorry. But let me just say a word or two about my, uh, my um, early Christian life. And um, I'm... I was saved in 1975. And so for these decades, just decades, I have enjoyed um, just the presence of God and the joy of the Lord. And I did not grow up in a Christian home. We had a good home, but we weren't Sunday school attending, Bible reading people. Um, I don't remember anybody ever lying, not getting away with it. Uh, you know, my brother and I might have lied, but you know, we grew up in a home where telling the truth mattered. And we had the basic principles of a decent, honest family. And um, even through a divorce, I never heard any ugly words, never saw any meanness go on. And, and um, But, you know, um, I got saved and I left for college. And I picked this Bible up and I started reading it. I got saved on Wednesday, started reading this Bible in a motel on Saturday. And I made the decision, this is my book. I just made that decision. I just kind of decided, you know, I'm going to trust it. Well, I went for uh, the next year and a half to a secular college, and I read this book by the hour. read it, and I just devoured it. Marked it up, color-coded it, created my own color code. I don't know where that, that idea came from. Later, when I was in Bible college, uh, our pastor talked about coloring your Bible and having a theme and like a legend so you could find things. But I'd already been doing that for a year and a half. Um, I didn't really have any organization, but, but um, oh, I love my Bible. And I didn't understand all the decisions I'd made. But I remember sitting in Bible college. So um, this, I've been saved about a year and a half. 
no, well, closer to two years. And I start Bible college, a little Bible institute. And I had this teacher who regularly said, now what this verse really should say, <clears throat> and he'd tell us that our King James Bible had the wrong words in it, or he'd say how this verse should have been translated. And he'll tell us what he thought the Bible should say, because he, he knew he knew Greek. I don't know if he knew any Greek. He probably was reading a Greek book, but whatever he knew is irrelevant. <clears throat> but but I heard that over and over. And I remember sitting, sitting in class thinking, I've been reading this book every year. I mean, every day for a couple of years now. And I know one thing, if I have to choose between the book in my lap and that teacher in front of class, I'm choosing the book. There came a point, and I don't know when, but in that first months, 20, you know, two months to 24 months that I was saved, when I submitted myself to the word of God, I surrendered myself to it. And I said, this book is right and the God of this book is right. And I may not understand what he does and I may cry and I may have a broken heart and I may hurt or be sick. Those that I love might go through deep valleys of difficulty, but I know this, I will submit myself to this book and this God. And I remember even before I was in Bible college, on my knees, um, just in, in prayer and, and weeping, tears of joy at the wonder that God loved me, the assurance, the absolute assurance in my heart that the eternal God loved me. And that was so beyond belief. And it just literally was an overwhelming thing that I just trusted his book. And here I was, a very young Christian. There was a graduate, uh, a couple of students or graduate students, they'd already gotten their four-year degree and they were staying on for master's or doctorate or whatever. And, um, but I knew them because they, they were saved and they went to a little on-campus Christian fellowship that I went to there for a while. And I did get going to the Baptist church there, but it took a little while to sort things out and where did I belong and stuff. I didn't, I didn't know anything, anything. I just was figuring it out one day at a time. Well, this couple wanted to have a child and couldn't have a baby. They, and they weren't married very long. They weren't very patient. And uh, we were talking one day on the way home from school and we were walking and they lived in apartments right nearby and I lived nearby. And and um, and somehow that subject came up and, and I've been reading. I've been reading these verses on prayer. I said, well, why don't we just ask God? God can give people babies. He gave people babies all, all through, through the Bible. You know, Hannah got a baby. Um, John the Baptist's mom, Elizabeth had a baby. Uh, Abraham's wife, Sarah, got a baby. Why don't we just pray? And, and they're just looking at me like I was some kind of weirdo. And so right there, here I am. I've been saved maybe a year. And I'm on this uh, dirt path from the college out toward where we were. And, and we prayed. And I just bowed my head and prayed and prayed for these two that God would give them a baby. <laughs> I'm like, I'm no Pente I didn't even know, the, you know what the word Pentecostal meant. I didn't know what a faith healer was. I didn't know... I didn't know they were all a bunch of corrupt, money-hungry, <laughs> deceived liars. I just knew I believed this book and submitted myself to it. And, oh, and just a matter of weeks later, they came and said, Bruce, you won't believe it. Uh, uh, my wife's expecting. I said, well, of course I believe it. I assumed it. I was expecting her to be expecting. And just this innocent faith that what God said he meant. I also believed he meant you need to get right when you've offended a brother. You need to go apologize. I also believed he, he meant what he said when he said you ought to witness and you ought to live pure. And, and it was there at that college I realized I couldn't go to the parties where the liquor ran like a river, whether I drank soda pop or booze. I couldn't go there. Um, I realized there's a crowd of people that are not godly. I, could, I couldn't hang around that crowd. And little by little, I, um, I just read it and learned it and tried to obey it. I submitted myself to it. And, and that's all before I, in the, the first two years of my Christian life. And look at Isaiah chapter 66 and verse um, 1 and 2. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you'll build in me? And where is the place of my rest? For all these things hath my hand made. And all those things have, be, have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look. God said, I'm not... I'm not impressed with you trying to build me a church building or a tabernacle or a temple. He said, but I'll tell you what, there is a guy I will look to. There's a guy that I will draw near to me. And he's about to describe that guy. Look at the middle of verse two. These things have been, saith the Lord, but to this man will I look, even him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, not talk about poor financially, but poor in your spirit, of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my words. 
Look down at verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. You know, there ought to be in the life of a child of God a point when you begin to tremble at his word. When you're poor in spirit, you realize I'm a nobody and I don't deserve anything. And in that time when any little sin that takes place, you're broken over, you're, you're contrite, a contrite spirit, contrition. Uh, I remember, remember just after I, I got started in Bible college, so I've been saved maybe two years and talking with a man that I was renting a little place from and, and, um, and we were just talking casually and he was older than my parents and very gracious guy there in the church. And, and somehow the conversation came along and I had stretched a story. I don't know what it was. And, you know, it could have been a fish this big. And uh, I, don't, I don't know what it was, but, but uh, you know, I walked away and I thought that wasn't the complete truth. And I lived right out in, right in their backyard in a trailer they had, a camp trailer, used their kitchen and, and um, ate meals with them. And um, well, I got, it wasn't 20 feet to my little trailer. I went from his door where we were eating lunch or whatever to my door. And before I got to my door, I was so convicted that I had not been completely honest, that I had not been truthful. And, and I got inside and I began to argue with the Holy Spirit. And I, Lord, he doesn't care whether I caught one fish or 10 or whether it was 10 inches long or 100 inches long. And he didn't care if I got this great or that great or ran this fast or jumped that high or shot this, whatever. I have no idea what it was we were talking about. But I had not been completely honest. I had, I had manipulated the conversation to make me look better than I was. And you know, when you begin to exalt yourself, or I think to abase yourself, to make you look less than you are, to get a, a, attention or a poor me, which is so prevalent in our culture, I think either one's wrong. It's, it's a lie. It's a flat out lie. And um, well, I was in that, that um, little camp trailer behind his house, and I don't know that I'll ever forget it, but I could have no peace. And within a few minutes, I realized, you know what? God doesn't want me being deceitful. I cannot go through this day, go to bed, get up tomorrow morning, go on with my life. I cannot expect God to bless me if I'm not honoring his book. I don't care. It's going to make me look stupid. It's going to make me look uh, like a, a liar. It's going to make me look ridiculous. What will this guy think of me? And I thought, you know what? It's God. I'm worried about what he thinks of me. That's what matters. I went back in there and said, hey, can I, I talk to you for a minute? I I said, you know, I lied about this and it's really this. And I said this and he looked at me because it wasn't anything that mattered. And he looked at me, he said, okay, or, or something like that, or it's not a big deal, or I don't care, but it was, he didn't care, but he cared. God cared. There's a God in heaven who wanted me to have a poor and a contrite spirit and someone that trembled at his word. For these 45 years of Bible reading every day and ministry and working with people and serving people, I guess 47 years or something since I got saved, reading this Bible every day, I'll tell you there's some joy that comes from submitting yourself to this book. So here I am in Bible college and this guy's correcting the Bible. And I just said, nope, not going to do it. I don't care what you say. I'm believing the printed page. And I didn't know the difference between a King James and a New International Version and a Revised Standard and a Douay Version and a New World Translation or Living Letters or Good News for Modern Man. I was reading a King James. But you know what? It didn't matter. That book, that King, and it does matter, versions. But the point is, this book in my hand, this old King James, I had submitted myself to that book. And there's so many things that happen. You see, when you submit yourself to God, when you surrender yourself, God begins to this man, verse 2 says, to this man will I look. God begins to look to you. He begins to focus on you. He begins to pay attention to you. When you surrender yourself to the word of God, the God of the word comes to you and begins to work in your life and guide and direct and and you want to ignore God's word, he'll ignore you. He'll let you go any old way you want to. But early on in my Christian life, I began to submit myself 
to this book. And I'd gone out many times to someone and said, I'm sorry and apologized. I didn't treat you right in this situation. And early on in my Christian life, I learned to get right. And then we were taught that having a short sin account, don't let a long time go between you doing wrong and you confessing it. You were harsh, you were unkind, or you did whatever. And going to that person, getting it right, um, keep a short sin account. That's such a biblical principle over in 1 John. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so to this man will I look and see the difference between somebody who is filled with bitterness and anger and uh, wrath and vengeance and someone who gets up each day enjoying life. I'll tell you the difference. One has submitted themselves to the Bible and one is not. One has let this world guide their heart and one has let this word guide their heart. Uh, you know, this. Look, look over to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12 or 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And I'll give you another thought that goes along with this. It's a matter of submitting ourselves to the word of God. Just simply saying, I am going to let the Bible tell me what to do. Hebrews chapter 4. Now you go into the military, unless you're going to get in the brig or a dishonorable discharge. Um, when you go into the military, you are going to submit yourself to a superior officer. And if he says, do push-ups, you do. If he says, run, you run. If he says, eat this, you eat it. If he says, sleep, now you sleep. You're in submission to that uh, that uh, military authority. And see, there's something powerful that takes place. When you submit yourself to this book, this is not just pages in ink. This book is supernatural. This is a living book. Look at Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick. That word quick is like the a living book. Um, the old uh, Western, the quick and the dead. And it's not talking... Of course, in that case, it's who's got a quick gun and who's dead. But but the illustration, the quick and the and the dead, it's the it's the dead or the living. And the word quick means living. For the word of God is living. It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. Now that's just describing what the Bible is. Now he describes what the Bible does, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit. Now the soul is your emotion, your intellect, your will, it's your personality. And the spirit is that thing that has fellowship with God. And in your body, there's a living spirit, and there's a living soul. And these two are so intertwined. You don't always know if it's the Holy Spirit leading you or if it's your soul, your old man, your person leading you. I want some chocolate ice cream with chocolate syrup and some brownies sprinkled over the top. That's soul. Uh, I need some time in prayer and I need to get right with this person I've offended or I've done wrong toward that spirit. And, and sometimes it's hard to know which it is. You know, you start talking about dating couples. And I don't care if they're 15 or 50. Um, you start talking about a relationship, boy, it can mess you up if you don't get the right person and your decision making process can be messed up. But, um, and I don't see any more wisdom in, in people I know who've gotten married at 50 and 60 uh, then I have seen wisdom in, in 20 and 25 year olds. And uh, it's a scary thing uh, to make relationship commitments. You got a spirit and you got a soul and they get intertwined. The word of God will pierce to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit. And this book will literally come into you and divide you. So you, it'll clearly reveal what soul and what spirit. And that's, un, that's an amazing thing. This book, the, the, no, no book, you read a book of a uh, history book, it's going to tell you what happened. You read a science book, it's going to tell you about science and the world and experiments or archaeology, anthropology, whatever. You read this book, it's going to tell you about you. You read this book, it's going to start pointing out selfishness, greed, bitterness, anger, wrath. It'll start pointing out um, you want to do this and, and you could do this. This book, this thing will start making you better for God. This book will make you aware of eternal things. It's, it divides. And then it says between the also and, and, um, and dividing a center of the soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow. Here's a knee joint and a, you know, in this socket here. And in between there's, there's marrow in the bones and there's a socket in there. And, and, and it, that's about as tight a thing as you can get. And it says it divides asunder the joints and the marrow. It'll split this thing all up. It will divide 
It'll separate so you know good and bad, right and wrong. You know, go this way or go that way. And uh, then look at the next thing. And is it discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart? You read this Bible and submit yourself to it. Say, God, you know, if you're, this is your book, I'm going to trust it. It'll help you. It'll discern. It will discern your intents. What is your intention? It'll discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And I've been in situations just not long ago. I was in a situation with some staff guys and, and I started to, to use an illustration to explain a biblical truth. And I just started into it and I stopped because I realized the way I was telling it was going to make me look good. And I stopped. I think it was about talking about somebody getting saved and how I was talking to somebody. And, and for, well, I don't know if that's exactly right. I can't remember because that didn't seem like it'd be completely appropriate or accurate. But I was saying, um, you know, I, I was able to talk to this person and I, I, I led them to Christ and I caught myself. I said, you know, the spirit of God worked on them and they chose to put their faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I stopped because I felt like I was kind of puffing me up a little bit. And see, that's the thoughts and the intents or the intentions of the heart. And this book, as you read it and you submit yourself to it, what will happen is as you yield your life to the word of God, the word of God will say, uh, 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 that's not exactly right. No, no, no. You're, you're going to be, you're making yourself look good. That's a pretty proud statement you're making. Um, uh, you know, you're giving that money. Maybe, you know, today I gave some money to a guy just outside a store and whether you should or shouldn't, that's everybody's got to make that decision. I don't always do it, but, but I just think if it was me, I'd want a couple of quarters or a dollar or something. And, and I try to give a gospel tract to people and witness in that situation. But, but, um, Oh, uh, you know, that's when that let not your right hand know what your left hand does. When you do your alms, tithes and offerings, what you give to the church and alm is what you give to the poor. And he said, when, you're, when you give your alms, don't even let your right hand know that your left hand gave that poor person a few coins. Um, just, just stay humble. It's not about you. It's not about what you gave. It's not about who you are. And see, in, in my Christian life with, with my wife, um, you know, I remember a situation I said something and and immediately I could see it hurt her. And the way I said it, and I stopped, and I said, let me explain, that's not what I meant the way it came out. What I meant was, and of course, you know, it's up to her whether to believe it or not, and and, um, and whether to have a wounded spirit or not, because you can be wounded, and you can nurture that wounded spirit. You can suck up to that thing and, and, and feed and nurture that wounded spirit till you're a wounded life and your whole life is one big wound. But I don't want to be that way. Neither does my wife, of course. But you see, the word of God doesn't just give me information. The word of God reads me. I read it. It reads me. I read it. It tells me what's going on in here. I read it. It says, no, that's carnal and that's spiritual. No, that's selfish and that's arrogant. And that's a good thing to do. That'll be a help. And the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so, you know, there are people out in this world, and whether they're saved or not, I don't know. I'm no man's judge. But maybe they go to church or maybe they don't. But, um, but oh, I've seen people, and they, they violate the principles in the Bible. And then they will do their very best to explain why it's okay that they don't obey the Bible. And see, when you don't submit yourself to the Word of God, what happens is the Word of God begins to close up to you. And the joy that you would get from it isn't there. And the peace that you would get from it is not there. And the things that the word of God would teach you, he'd teach you the, the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And pretty soon you're going down a path and you look back and you think, how did I ever get here? How did I get in a mess like this? And, and you can't see. And you see this book over in Psalms 119, he says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. As we submit ourselves to the word of God and say, I'm going to trust the Bible. The, the Bible turns this light on and you can see. And I'm not saying every day is easy. And I'm not saying you don't sit in the doctor's office and worry and go in with your spouse going in for surgery. I, I look, I'm not, I'm not saying well, we don't worry and fret. We're human, we're flesh. But this book will turn the light on and say, all right, now you're worrying a little much. That's that soul Let's get living in the spirit. Uh, let's get ourselves focused on eternal things. 
And the word of God helps us part these things and clarify things. And, you know, you put this in the trash pile and this in the save pile and, and uh, in your, you know, in your mail or whatever. And God's word, this book will do that to our heart and to our mind. And he'll say, hey, you know that, that thing you just saw, put that in the trash pile. And uh, let's put this in the save pile. This is good stuff you've got a chance to read somewhere along the way. And, and little by little, and I, well, I see people who violate the scriptures whether it be greed or selfishness or bitterness or whatever it might be. And they're fighting, viciously fighting for one more, whatever it might be. You know, I think it was J. Paul Getty who was asked how much money is enough. And he said, one more dollar. And uh, the, oh, the greed that comes in just recently, uh, just recently, a dear uh, church member came to me and there's a family member nearing the end of life. And, and the family member left this family member in charge of the estate. And then the others we're convincing this family member that what this person told them in person was what they thought should be done. And, uh, oh, and the greed and, the, you know, there's no joy in that. Because this book will give you peace in here. You know, Paul, that's why Paul said in Philippians chapter one, he said that Christ would be magnified. Let me see, I've got it here. Um, Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. I'm, I don't want to be ashamed of how I've acted. I'm not gonna, I don't want to be ashamed of what I've loved. Not, I don't want to be ashamed of who I've hung around or what I've done with my life. Um, that I shall not be ashamed, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And Paul said, if I... If I die, it's it's God's life. If I live, it's God's life. If I, in other places, Paul said, I, I can be broke, I can be full, I can have plenty, I can have want, I can be in day and a night in the deep shipwreck, floating around in the Mediterranean until I'm rescued. It's God. God takes care of me. God's got a plan. If I lose everything, and I mentioned uh, not long ago, I mentioned a man, the good man in our church, has moved out of the area, but a very faithful good man, and he said. Um, he had, had his own business and he lost his business in the, in a very difficult time when the first Gulf War broke out about 19, I don't know, late 80, 1980s, early 90s. And he lost his business. And in the process of, the, of that, he lost his home and he had a beautiful home. And, and his wife, of course, she loved her house and, and the, the family there and the kids. And, but you know what? They didn't lose what was important. They had their marriage and they had their children. And, uh, now and now, many years later, you know that house didn't matter. They learned. They got another home. I got to see the next house. It was nicer than the first one. And and they came out of it, and everything's okay. And, uh, you know, well, look, this book, submit yourself to the Word of God. Surrender to the Word of God. Do it God's way. Do it God's way. If you're battling today, you're battling the anxiety and the hurt, submit yourself to God. And I know if you do, if you're going to submit to it, you're going to have to read it. Read it a lot and look at it. Say, God, you tell me. Go to your Bible and say, God, I don't know anything. You know everything. Please correct me where I need corrected. Please guide me where I need guided. And God, I want your will. Please show me. If you show me in your book what to do, I'll do it. Submitting yourself to the word of God. And you know what will happen is, is uh, like in Isaiah, to this man will I look. To him that is of a poor and a contrite spirit who trembleth at my word. Are we afraid of disobeying the Bible? I mean, do we tremble for fear of violating the commands of God? See, when we do, God says, there you go. That's my kid right there. You better be afraid of disobeying me. You better be afraid of violating my word. Look, in our home, we didn't want to disobey our parents. Uh, I never remember getting a spank in my whole life, but something happened to make me fear my parents. And uh, and I remember one time my brother getting a spank in it only once, but I'll tell you, we feared our parents. We weren't going to disobey our parents. And we might, if we were real careful and thought we'd get away with it, we're not saints. But um, but you know, we, we wanted so much to not get in trouble. And uh, God says, I want you to tremble at my word. And we've got people all over from Bible college professors to pastors to church members who they're, they operate re, uh, without regard for the Bible or they correct it, they rewrite it, write what they want it to say. Or they say, yeah, yeah, I know it says that. That's not what it means. 
and, and they lie and cheat and steal. It's whatever. Greedy, selfish, bitter. You know, the Bible says, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. And there have been moments in our 40 plus years of marriage when a little bitterness began to well up toward my wife. And I said, nope, 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 nope. Shut that down. It has nothing to do with how my wife treats me. It has everything to do with the command of God. God said, don't be bitter towards your wife. And I have to reject that emotion. I have to confess that emotion and get that out of there because I want to please God. And if my wife treats me like trash, which she doesn't, but if she does, I still want God to treat me like gold. And he's the one that matters. Though he slay me, Job said, yet will I trust him. I'm going to trust his book. I'm going to submit myself to his book. I'm going to tremble at his word. I'm going to let his word open my eyes and be a light to my path. I'm going to let his word discern between the spirit and the flesh. And what a book, what a great God. And all I can say in these decades of reading my Bible and marriage and, and church ministry and raising my kids is this. I believe that somewhere early on in my Christian life, when I chose this book to be my guide, that's when happiness was introduced to me. As I learned to live for others, as I learned to obey this Bible in giving, in giving of time, in giving of talents, in giving of treasure, uh, when I learned to be patient with people, to be merciful with people, I learned to not be a false accuser. I learned to be a I learned to be a gentleman. The Bible talks so much about your behavior, gentlemanly behavior. And I learned, to, I, little by little, I learned things. I, was, I just want it. What a great life, this book. This book, this piece of leather and paper and ink, this thing is living. And I promise you, it's the best thing that'll ever happen to you. Hope you have a great day. Thanks for spending a few minutes together today.